Hi everyone and welcome to our online service of worship for today, Sunday the 20th of September. Our focus for today is going to be on the set New Testament reading, which is part of Paul's first letter to the church in Philippi. In this reading, Paul is grappling with the choice between life and death. He says that to die and to be with Christ is far better. However, there are those, the Philippians among them, who need his ministry to continue and he therefore chooses life for now. He then urges his readers to conduct themselves in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Christ by standing firm in the spirit without being afraid of those who oppose them. But as always, however you are engaging with our service today, via Facebook or YouTube, hard copy or audio CD, I pray that we will be united in the never-ending love of God as we seek to bring glory and honour to him alone, through Christ our Lord. Our call to worship. The Lord our God is great and to be highly praised. Come, all you people, come and worship. The Lord our God is great beyond our understanding. Come, all you people, come and worship. The Lord our God is loving and full of mercy. Come, all you people, come now and worship the one true God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Lord God, we all belong to your kingdom and we bring our different lives and our different experiences to worship you, the true and living God today. Lord of all that has been, of all that is and of all that will be, we have all been born and one day we will all die. But today is a day when all of us are here, here to worship and to praise your holy name and to give thanks for the gift of eternal life through the sacrifice of Christ. Accept, O God, all that we bring and all that we offer in the name of that same Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. As already mentioned, the reading that we're going to be looking at today deals with Paul wrestling, wrestling with whether it is better to live or to die. To die is to be united with Christ forever, but to live brings with it the opportunity of continuing to grow the kingdom here on earth, regardless of what he personally is going through. We'll say more about that later. Our points are therefore going to be standing on God's word. What happens when a believer dies? And also seeking to glorify God by walking in faith. But first, we declare that we have indeed heard the call of the kingdom and we lift our eyes to the king. We sing together, hear the call of the kingdom.
We come before God now in prayer as we offer our prayers of praise and confession. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come before you now, we praise you for all that you are, for the creation that is yours, for its beauty and wonder, for its diversity and richness. We praise you for your presence and your comfort that swaddle us in your purity and enrich us with your abundance. We praise you for your steadfastness that perseveres with us, although we are faltering disciples and failing followers. We praise you that day by day you amaze and enrich us and you reveal yourself in new and unexpected ways. We praise you that you are the same yesterday, today and forever, and yet also forever new. O Lord, our God, you are indeed, from the depth of our being, highly to be praised. However, almighty and sovereign God, we don't always know how we got to where we are, and we certainly don't always know where we are going. We don't always choose the right path, and we certainly don't always follow it. We don't always deal well with the struggles of life, and we don't always give thanks for the joys of life either. We don't always think of the effects that our choices have on others, both near and far. We are too selfish, wanting what we want, no matter what the cost may be to others. Almighty God, forgive us, reassure us, and cradle us with your forgiveness. For we praise you for the assurance that our sins are indeed forgiven through the precious blood of your Son and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We focus on the forgiveness that is ours through Christ now as we sing together, Empty, Broken, Here I Stand.
We listen now to our reading from Paul's first letter to the church in Philippi. Philippians chapter 1 For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one Spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. As we ponder that reading, we reflect on the fact that we are all called to live and to die for Christ. The words from verse 5 are particularly wonderful. Self on the cross and Christ upon the throne. We sing together, Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided.
As some may already know, when Paul wrote this letter to the church in Philippi, he was in prison in Rome. However, this was not his final imprisonment, although of course he wasn't to know that at the time. Whilst he was awaiting trial, he was aware that he could either be released or executed. However, he trusted in Christ to work things out for his deliverance. Paul's prayer was that when he stood trial, he would speak courageously for Christ and not be timid or ashamed. Whether he lived or died, he wanted Christ to be exalted. And as it turned out, he was indeed released from this particular imprisonment, only to be arrested again two or three days later. But it was his faith in Christ and his faith in Christ alone that sustained him in such times of adversity. For those who do not believe in God, life on this earth is quite literally all that there is, and so it's natural for them to strive for this world's values. Those values can be money, popularity, power, pleasure or prestige. For Paul, however, to live meant to develop eternal values and to tell others about Christ, who alone could help them to see life from an eternal perspective. Paul's whole purpose in life was to speak out boldly for Christ and to become more like him. Therefore, Paul could confidently say that dying would be even better than living, because in death he would be removed from worldly troubles and, as we read in 1 John 3, would see Christ face to face. The message for us, as hard as it is, therefore surely has to be that if we are not ready to die, then essentially we are not ready to live. We need to make certain of our eternal destiny, because then and only then will we be free to serve, devoting our lives to what really counts, without the fear of death hanging over us. Paul also very much had a purpose for living, through encouraging, by visiting or by writing letters to all of the churches that he either established or took under his wing. And we need a purpose for living too. Every single one of us needs a purpose that goes beyond providing for our own physical needs. So we need to ask ourselves, who can we serve and who can we help? What's more, have we truly discovered our very purpose for living? As we near the end of the reading that we're looking at, we read that Paul considered it a privilege to suffer for Christ. Now, I would expect the majority of us, if not all of us, certainly would not consider suffering as a privilege at all. Yet, when we do suffer, if we faithfully represent Christ, our message and our example affect not only us, but also those with whom we have contact. When we suffer for our faith, it doesn't mean that we have done something wrong. In fact, the very opposite is often true. It verifies that we have indeed been faithful, and that enables us to use suffering to build up our character rather than resenting it or trying to tear it down. Throughout his life, the Apostle Paul suffered for spreading the gospel, and like the Philippians that he's writing to, we are in the same position too. Our points for today are therefore standing on God's word, what happens when a believer dies, and seeking to glorify God by walking in faith. We look first then at standing on God's word. Paul, as we may know, regularly used the Old Testament as the authority for his teaching. But in many translations of the Bible, it can be quite difficult to tell when a New Testament writer is quoting from the Hebrew Scriptures. Some, however, like the complete Jewish Bible, make those references totally clear. The CJB Virgin points out 183 Old Testament passages that Paul quotes or paraphrases in his writings. And this figure doesn't include his additional dozens of references to people, to places and to events in the Old Testament. If we believe that all scripture is essentially God-breathed, then Paul was quite literally standing on God's word throughout his entire ministry, following his life-changing experience on the road to Damascus. Each one of us would do well to follow Paul's example of standing on God's word too. And actually, we also have the whole of the New Testament to add to the resources that were at Paul's disposal. Now, I'm not sure how many of us will have heard of Dr. Fred Smith, 
But Dr. Smith was a renowned professor of biochemistry at the University of Minnesota until his untimely death on the 1st of February, 1965. Fred Smith was a scientist through and through, and he was convinced that, in his words, if we could get enough intelligent people together, the problems of the world could be solved, including personal problems. But this approach left him still searching for answers to life's biggest questions. However, to his utter amazement, Fred Smith discovered the person of Jesus Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. That night, Billy Graham was speaking about Nicodemus in John's Gospel, who, as we know, came to Jesus by night, asking what could be described as ultimate life-searching questions. Fred saw himself in this story, going by night, curious, yet not wanting his professional colleagues to know of his search. Fred Smith made a decision that evening, a leap of faith, to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour, something that was seemingly incompatible with his long-held scientific, proof-orientated approach to life. But in fact, he decided to do what he had always done, conduct an experiment. He would treat the claims of Jesus as a life experiment, and he discovered a peace of mind and a freedom from fear that he had never known before. Deep and abiding faith in God's unchangeable word engulfed him. But perhaps most importantly of all, he was absolutely the real deal at home too. He believed the words from Exodus 10, tell your children and your grandchildren the incredible things I am doing. Fred's daughter Brenda shares some scriptures that she learned from her dad, and we're going to look at just a few of them now. From 1 Corinthians 13, love never fails. When Fred's doctor said he was dying, Brenda said, no, I'll take him home and he'll live. She did, and he did. Many older people who die of natural causes actually die of loneliness. But love is still our healthiest environment. It's God's greatest gift to us, and it's our greatest gift to one another. From Romans 5, tribulation produces perseverance. We mustn't miss the good that is in the bad things that happen along the journey. The trials we face can be positive or negative, depending on how we use them. Certain people expect life to run on their own timetable, but tribulation has its own agenda and its own pace, and patience is the only antidote to that. From Romans 12, don't burn out, keep yourselves fueled. The director of a big company confirms that engineers who retire without a plan to stay busy often die within 16 months. By not staying involved in life, we are subconsciously giving ourselves permission to die. Fred Smith's philosophy was, you cannot let up and keep up. Paul said in our reading today, as long as I am alive, there is good work for me to do. And as long as we are alive, there is good work for us to do too. Point one is standing on God's word. The second thing we're looking at is what happens when a believer dies. In this letter to the church in Philippi, Paul is wrestling with the dilemma of whether it is better to live or to die. Now that must seem strange to most of us, but the fact remains that no matter how much we enjoy where we are living at this present time, there is always a longing in our heart. That longing is for the place that we can truly call home, our forever home, a home like no other, our eternal home in the heavenly kingdom. This world has beautiful shorelines and landscapes, but deep down we yearn, like Paul, for our heavenly father, our heavenly family, and our heavenly home. As Paul says in verses 21 and 22, for to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and to be with Christ, which would be far better for me. Leaving this life to be with Christ in Paul's judgment is far better. But the question is, far better than what? 
The answer in Paul's opinion is quite simply better than absolutely anything else. Paul is unshakable in his belief that nothing here on earth can compare with what awaits us. As he writes in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul believed that no one has ever seen or heard anything like this, never so much as imagined what God has arranged for those who love him. But one of the things that we yearn to know is, how will this transition happen? Well, maybe the answer comes in Ecclesiastes 12, where we read that at death, the dust, in other words, our body, returns to the ground it came from, and our spirit returns to God who gave it in the first place. Our bodies will fall asleep in Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, and our God-indwelled spirits return to his presence, delighting in the fullness of joy and revelling in the pleasures forevermore that are found in abundance at his right hand, as we read in Psalm 16. While we wait, anticipating our best days, heaven's hosts rehearse for the drama of the ages, the awesome return of Christ and our accompanying him in our glorified bodies. Our prayer, as we read in Revelation 22, therefore surely has to be, Come, Lord Jesus. Point two is what happens when a believer dies. Our third and final point for today is taken from Paul's desire to serve Christ and to do so whatever that looks like. In other words, seeking to glorify God by walking in faith. Think for a moment of Gethsemane, the garden where Jesus himself wrestled with the will of God. Take this cup from me, Jesus says in Mark 14. It was a reference to the cup of punishment that Jesus did not deserve. Jesus knew he'd have to drink it and drink it to the dregs. But before he did, Jesus asked his father if he could take it away, if there was another way. But then he qualified this request with the ultimate prayer of surrender. Not my will, but yours be done, as we read in Luke 22. Most of the time, if we're honest, our prayers tend to focus on external circumstances more than internal attitudes. Because generally speaking, we would rather have God change our circumstances rather than changing us. It's a lot easier that way. But we miss the point altogether. It's the worst of circumstances that more often than not brings out the best in us. And if it's the bad things that bring out the good, then maybe the things that we see as bad are not so bad after all in the grand scheme of things. It's only when we've been tested that we have a testimony to share with others. Yes, of course, we can be and we are saved without suffering, but we cannot be spiritually matured or equipped for service without suffering to a certain degree. It's a bit like those, including me, who come to ministry a little later in life. Life's experiences, the knocks we encounter and the bumps in the road we meet along the way enable us to have a greater understanding of those who are going through times of testing themselves. That doesn't mean that we should seek out suffering, but it does mean that we should see it for what it is, an opportunity to glorify God. Paul, who suffered greatly, writes, For you have been given the privilege of suffering for him. Where did Paul find such strength? Well, perhaps the answer can be found in Romans 8, where we read, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. So we need to seek to glorify God in every circumstance that life throws at us. And we do that by walking in faith. When we decide to fly to a certain destination, various things have to work together in order to make that possible. And it's the same when we walk by faith. Firstly, we need to identify the right airline and flight schedule that will get us to our intended destination. Secondly, the plane must operate on a timetable that tells us when it will be leaving and when it's arriving, and that the pilot has the route worked out in advance. Next, 
the airline has to set a price that we can afford to pay. Then they put our name in a computer and everything is ready to go. However, here's what's not going to happen when we arrive at the airport. We're not going to ask them to explain how the plane works, what buttons the pilot plans to push, and what the equipment will do if he or she pushes them. We're not going to check out the routes they plan to take, or ask how fast they plan to fly or how high, or whether the pilot plans to fly on manual control or on autopilot. We're not going to argue about the price after we've already made our reservation and paid our fare. Why is that? Because we're confident that the equipment is sound and the pilot is experienced. We know we'll safely reach our destination. Now we might think, yes, but what happens if the plane goes down? But if we are redeemed children of God, we go up. As Paul says in verse 23 of the reading that we're looking at, to depart and to be with Christ is far better. In other words, either way, we win. Basically, when we fly, we put our trust in the plane, we put our trust in the pilot, and we put our trust in the airline. God is simply asking us to do the same with him, no more and no less, seeking to glorify God by walking in faith. So, just to recap, our points have been, firstly, standing on God's word. Secondly, what happens when a believer dies. And finally, seeking to glorify God by walking in faith. May God's holy name indeed be praised. Amen. Paul says in the reading from Philippians that we've been looking at, that whatever happens, we need to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Jesus is our light and our strength, and we celebrate that now as we sing together, In Christ alone, my hope is found.
We come now to our prayers of intercession. Let's pray together. Eternal, ever-living, ever-present God, in the struggles and joys of this day and every day, we pray for those who are overburdened, weighed down, demoralised, fearful or desolate because of what life has thrown at them. We hold before you those who are engulfed in pain and overwhelmed by anguish, for those facing illness and death. We pray for those who are troubled in mind, body and spirit, who seem unable to find any peace or calm. We hold before you those who are alone and those who struggle with loneliness, those who are without friend or comfort. We pray for those who are frightened and bewildered, those who see no direction or purpose in their lives. Eternal, ever-living God, bless them all in this and every hour. Bless them all in this and every step of life's journey. And we bring all of our prayers together by joining in the words of the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we look towards being able to worship together in our buildings once again from October, we pray that God will pour out his endless power upon us so that we may be enabled to give him the glory. We sing together, God of grace and God of glory, on your people pour your power. Lord, give us a way to go, a path to follow, a purpose to fulfil, and meaning to all our deeds. And as we leave this time of worship in praise now, may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with each one of us, with all those we love, and with all those we continue to pray for, both this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. 